Okay. Okay. I don't know if he's been there or just talks to him on. Right. I felt bad because I called Susie at work. <laughs> I didn't know she was there. I was like, oh no, I'm so sorry. I'm like, fine, you're fine. Uh, but I figure sometime we'll see him. Mike, he said he's going to be here Sunday. He wants to see us, so. Okie dokie. Uh, we're in Galatians chapter 2, uh, the truth of the gospel. If you remember chapter 1, it was, I believe I had that title, the truth of the gospel in Paul's defense. So to kind of get a, a review of what happened in chapter 1, um, Paul's addressing the Galatian church, and there's a problem going on. There were some Jewish false teachers that have entered the church, and they have been teaching that a different gospel. Paul calls this a different gospel in chapter 1, verse 6. And I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, it says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Uh, so the main thing we, I think that we need to remember and focus on is there is a true gospel and there's a false gospel. There's one, the gospel of Christ and then there is a false gospel. And that is what these people were teaching. But it is, essentially they were just teaching that you had to keep the Mosaic Law in addition to faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. That, that's that in a nutshell. And Paul is ticked. I mean, he comes into this letter ticked. He is mad. Uh, if, you, if you pay attention to how he normally writes his letters in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, he always normally addresses the church with grace to you, peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for you. And then that's normally how he does his letters. He's got a pattern. But with this, he just dies right into it, and he, he's got, there's a problem at hand that needs to be addressed. But Jewish false teachers have come into the church, and Paul's wanting to call them out. But he's amazed that the Christians that he had taught the gospel are turning back to follow the Mosaic Law. They're turning back to follow the Mosaic Law. And it's not only following the Mosaic Law that's the problem. They're relying on the Mosaic Law. They're keeping of commandments to save them. Paul says this is a different gospel. And the reason why this um, letter is near and dear to my heart is because I was entrenched in legalism. I relied on my continual, my obedience to God's law to save me. I really did. I never would say it like that. I never really admitted it that way. I had faith in Jesus, but it wasn't in Him alone. I was having faith in myself and my own efforts. So, I think of modern day false gospels today. You have a lot of those being taught in many churches. That you must do this, 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 in addition to faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, well, you're not going to be saved. That is a false gospel that is similar to this one. And because I don't hear people nowadays going around saying, hey, you need to be circumcised to be saved. I have never heard that. But back then, that was the thing. Uh, but today, you just have, you have different gospels that are not the true gospel. And in the entirety of Galatians, as when we're done with this, we'll see that a person is justified by faith alone and Christ alone, period. Completely apart. I know I hammer that in all the time. The reason I do is because I come from a background where I was hammered that you must do these things to be saved. I mean, that's what they said. And I hear that in many churches. So I come back and hammer what Paul's saying. It's about faith in Christ. You can't do anything to save yourself. It doesn't, there's nothing in you that you can contribute to your salvation. All you can do is receive it by faith. That's it. That's, that's it. At the end of the day, that's all you can do. Um, but now we're in chapter 2. Um, Paul, in, kind of back up at chapter 1 for a quick second, he received this revelation of Jesus, from Jesus himself, um, the gospel, and he went up to the, um, the apostles who were at Jerusalem to kind of get a confirmation. And they gave him the right hand of fellowship. Peter's job was to preach the gospels to the Jews. Paul's job was to preach the gospel to us Gentiles. Uh, unless there's a, a Jewish Christian here. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but So Galatians chapter 2, kind of like what we did last month. I would say last week, but last month. Uh, we're just going to read that and then just kind of go based off of the questions of the study guide um, that we have and I prepared. So, Galatians chapter 2. 
Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain. But not, not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Verse 4, this matter arose excuse me, because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Now from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. These people, they added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, just as Peter was for the circumcised. Since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, those who are recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only that we would remember the poor, which I had made every effort to do. Verse 11. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles, before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, because he feared those from circum the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, If you, who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Verse 15, We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet because we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. But if we ourselves are also found to be sinners, while seeking, that word right there, take note of that, seeking to be justified by Christ, uh, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things that I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness, right here, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Or in other words, he died for no reason at all. That's chapter 2. Um, there's a lot in that chapter right there. Uh, so, um, I think I prepared... What was it? Six, yeah, six questions for this one. And question number one specifically has to do with the first five verses. It says in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1 to 5, false believers had secretly snuck into the church. According to Paul, they had specific motives. What does he say their motives were? Now, I don't know what translation you're reading from, uh, uh, but this CSB, but I don't know. Is, is there a specific, that was my question, is there a specific translation you prefer? Okay, I didn't know. Because sometimes I get up there, I'll have a different translation, and then I'll go home thinking, well, maybe I should just stick to one. <laughs> okay, I use I used many for my studies and stuff like that. But um, can, you, can you find out in verses 1 to 5, Paul says what their motives were? In verses 1 to 5. 
These people who snuck in, these are these people came secretly. They were like spies. They came into the church with specific motives. They weren't there to, you know, really kumbaya. They had specific motives. Exactly. Yeah. Wanted to bring them into bondage. Uh, I have highlighted in this Bible. Uh, verse 4. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks, our church, to spy on the freedom we have in Christ in order to enslave us. So, Christians have freedom in Christ. We're free from sin. We're free from the law. We don't have to, we don't have to keep the law to be justified. It's uh, by justification in Jesus Christ alone. Uh, but they came into the church secretly to spy on the freedom that Chris, these Christians had in order to get them to go back to the Mosaic Law, in order to throw another yoke, another bondage on their neck again. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, have, you guys, have you guys ever experienced anything similar to that, known of any churches nowadays who add requirements to Christians and say, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever personally had experience with that, but... You know, they're clearly out there. And I don't say that in a judgmental way. That's just the reality. They're out there, and there are people who seek to add additional requirements to salvation. How a person gets right with God, they want... It's as if faith in Jesus alone, they're... I, it's as if they're against that. It's as if they want there to be something more. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Well, I have a question. Wait, you would be surprised how much... Stuff we talk on the golf course. Oh yeah, I got to get out there with him. And uh, I have a friend of mine, uh, uh, Larry Mills, mm -hmm. and bless his heart, me and him was talk. Uh, he was like me mm -hmm. and never went to church, mm -hmm. never had anything to do with church. Yep. Right. Until he got married. Yeah. Now his wife is uh, Pentecostal. Pentecostal. Yep. Okay, she grew up in the Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad are in the Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Right. And I believe the Pentecostals once talked some times. Yeah, yes, they are. Okay, he's went, they've, they've been married over 30 years and mm -hmm. stuff, and he goes faithful. Good for him. But he says, that, and, and he says, no one in that church has ever pressured him, you know, or called him out, or ever pressured him, or ever said anything to him. And he said, oh, I've never talked in tongues. And he said, and says, I don't know if I'm missing, you know, am I missing the boat? Because other people get out talking tongues and stuff. He said, I just sat there because, right. it's, you know, yeah. and, and I told him, I said, and I said well, I, I personally believe talking in tongues is a gift because it's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of stuff in that Bible that I have not been called to do. Right. Yeah, and... And, and, and that's why I told him. Right. The senator said, if you're called to do it, right. you'll do it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not called to do it, mm -hmm. don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, as long as you keep your faith and everything, mm -hmm. it's just something that the Lord has never called you. There's no way I can explain it to you. Yeah. Without yeah. sitting there going, I don't know about this stuff, you know, but... Right. Yeah. No way I explained it to him. I said, so, I, you know... Here you go, Mom. Yes. They're very good about not, you know, pointing you out all these years or trying right, to pray right. for you. Yeah, that. yeah. So they're very good at that. Right. Too. They're very yeah. good to him about Yes, it. yeah, absolutely. But, but he kind of worried that he was missing the boat somewhere because yeah. he never had that feeling come over him after all those years. Yeah. And I just told him, I said, yes, it's in the Bible. And yep. Yes, I believe in it. Mm -hmm. But I've never been called to do it. Yeah. And speaking in tongues... There's, it's amazing how many things Christians debate over. Speaking in tongues, that's one of those topics. Some people believe that speaking in tongues is speaking in a different angelic voice. Another person believes that speaking in tongues is just speaking in a foreign language, as if you got a Japanese person in here, speaking in tongues would be speaking in their language. They believe that. Or, I think the reason why, what would you say, is that Larry? Yeah. The reason why uh, he felt like he was missing the boat, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. But there's some people who teach that if you don't speak in tongues, then you're not going to heaven. Well, uh, he never mentioned that. Okay, well that's great, fantastic, because I would say that's false. That, that's completely false. And I don't mean that in any judgmental way. No, no, no. That's just wrong. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, 
Yeah, that's. Uh, and you said that was Pentecostal church. I know there's other churches, not just the Pentecost, yeah. that believe that. But like I said, you know, and I think, you know, like I said, I think it reassured him when I said, yeah, I believe it. But it's in the Bible. Absolutely. And, but I said, yeah. if you're not called to do this, you're not called to do it. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. I think I put his mind a little bit. Yeah. Like, you know, like, yeah. you know everything. Because he never mentioned anything about not going to hell right. because he did. Absolutely, and that's that's fantastic. That's good, but there so are some good, to it. good. But there's some people out there though that would secretly come in, spy out your freedom, and a person who believes that you must speak in tongues to be saved, they would say, "Okay, do you speak in tongues?" Well, no, I don't. Well, you should you should be doubting your salvation because you may not be saved. See that? That's bad. But uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, spiritual gifts are still rampant in the church now. Church that we come from. They believe most spiritual gifts are gone. They had their own time, which I can't. I can't see that in the scriptures. I, I study my Bible a lot. I don't know everything at all. But I'll tell you what. I'm not. I, I, I know what I read, and I make sure I triple check it. Uh, but it's yeah, it's crystal clear that spiritual gifts are still here today. Uh, but groups have some Christians don't believe they do, and that's a secondary issue. That has nothing to do with your salvation or how you get right with God. How you get right with God. Paul's hammering this in. I don't know if it stuck out to you when he said in verse 15, uh, he's saying, We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet, because we know, these Jews knew, that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, we ourselves have also believed in Jesus Christ. So Paul even knew, there's nobody that's going to get right with God by law keeping. It, it ain't going to happen. And, I mean, in the big picture of things, uh, one sin, you commit one sin, you're done. Because God's standard, if you want to get right with law, him by law, is perfection. You got to do it all, 100. percent If you want to get right with Him that way, then be my guest. But unfortunately, the scriptures say all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. So if that's your only avenue is by faith in Christ. Uh, it took me a while to understand that because I was entrenched in legalism. So I mean, have mercy, right? <laughs> um, but yes, their motives. These people came in secretly to spy out the freedom that Christians have. And there's still, as we've said, there's people today who still want to do that. And that's why and I, Christians try not to be judgmental, and that's wonderful. Uh, but you got to be, what Jesus say? Be in, wise as a serpent, but innocent as a dove. You know, be wise, you know, if, if you sense that, you know, if a bell's going off in your head, that might be something you want to address. I don't know, to yourself, to your friends, spouse, whatever. Uh, but okay, uh, question number two. Paul refused to submit to their gospel. Verse four, he said, uh, he said, where? Uh, actually, verse five, I got it wrong on the paper. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Um, what can we learn from this? Paul refused to submit to their gospel. What can we learn from this? What do you think we can learn from that? They didn't give up. He did not give up and submit to these people, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. I think it's important. The reason why he didn't is because, I mean, if if he were for one second to say, okay, guys, I'm going to submit to circumcision, that would completely probably discredit everything he had just taught them, his whole ministry, and then these Galatian Christians would have thought, okay, I do have to keep the Mosaic Law to be saved. And, but thank God, in the, later, in the rest of chapter 2, he makes it crystal clear, that's not how you're saved. You know, commandments have their place in the life of a Christian. Obeying God does, but when it gets, comes to getting right with him, that's not the way. Uh, but I think it's, I just think it's, it stands out to me when he says, you know, we did not give up and submit to these people even for a moment because we didn't want the truth of the gospel to, to be tampered with. We wanted it to be preserved for you. Um, so I think today, how can we apply that today? We're not, we're not living in Galatia. We're, not, you know, we're just reading as Christians here in Selma, Indiana. He just didn't want it to be, didn't want it to be corrupt. That's right, yeah. And, and you know, what, what, give an inch here. That's you right. Know, to make everybody happy yep. on that inch. As we see, yep. the inch turns to a couple of feet. That's right. And then 
yeah. than a mile yep. in the end. Yep. And then you've lost yeah. what yeah. you began with. Yeah. And you I think that's what, what it meant. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, if if Paul would just yeah, okay, well, get circumcised. Oh, okay, that's okay. Well he had already been circumcised. He was already a Jew yeah. at eight days. Uh eight year eight days old. But the point is, these people are saying you gotta keep the Mosaic law. And the law had its purpose. Paul essentially saying, the law is done away with. It's here to teach us. We're not under the law to be justified. It had its purpose. God made it for its purpose. But you got to get away from that. That's not, you got to stop. Christ has come. The Messiah has come. He's here. This is your source of salvation. Um, and, yeah, I, like, what's he say in 1 Corinthians or second? A whole leaven, leaven's a whole lump of dough. So, like, uh, I'm not... I can't cook for anything. So you know what I mean, bread and your... <laughs> Okay. Give me a break, guys. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just eat it, man. <laughs> uh, okay. Question number three. Apostles such as James, Cephas, and John all recognize that Paul was the real deal. In chapter two, verse nine to ten, we see that the apostles wanted to make sure that the poor were remembered. What are some ways we can help the poor? Do you know of anyone who is poor? Personally. Now, the unfortunate part is that there are people who like to stand on the side of the road today, act like they're poor, they get in their 2000, what, 15, B, I don't know, you get what I'm saying. They act like they're poor and they're not. That's, that's, I think that comes to being wise as serpents and innocent as doves again. Um, I have met many people on, online through social media I'll get messages all the time from foreign countries, and they're saying they're always in need. And you got to be wise with that. You got to be careful because that's social media. You got to be really wise. And uh, but I have personally given to people who I am confident are legit because I would go through other sources to make sure. And there is a there is a gadget on the internet. If you ever have done that, be very careful on doing that. But if you've ever given over social media, you can actually Google has this thing where you can copy their photo. Take it to Google.com images and see if someone's using a fake photo. It's really neat. And, uh, but uh, I know there are a lot of widows and orphans over in foreign countries that are really, I mean, especially due to COVID-19. Not just foreign countries, here in America, too. Here in Canada and all sorts of stuff. But uh, uh, back to the question, what are some ways we can help the poor? Do you know anyone who's poor? And you, you don't necessarily have to answer this out loud. Just get you thinking. Uh, the apostles wanted them to re Paul to remember the poor. This was really important to the apostles. Remember the poor. Don't ignore them. Um, makes me think in Acts chapter two, um, after Israel was repenting and coming to Christ, um, it says that they met together every day. They shared their food and they sold all their possessions that they had and gave to those who were in need. So I think to myself, oh God, was, what I read from that, uh, I try to uh, see what I can learn to that, from that because it wasn't directly written to me, but I can learn something from God wants me to be a giving person. So if I know someone who is poor, and don't have to just be finances either. Don't, don't make it think like I'm just talking about money. You can give your time, you can give your love, you can give your encouragement because um, there are many people poor in spirit right now. You know, They need the uplifting and encouragement. But... <laughs> There are a lot of people <laughs> who are in need of um, just help, too, with finances and all that. Uh, well, a lot of these, or not a lot, but these guys here were with Jesus, mm -hmm. and he um, ministered a lot to the poor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they saw how important they were right. to Jesus, I think. You know, they I, I agree, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. They were Jesus, and yeah. they didn't want that part of Jesus' ministry maybe to be forgotten. Yeah. Absolutely. That's just kind of what I think. Yeah. And I always, I always try to think, Jesus didn't have a vehicle. He walked everywhere. They walked everywhere. Uh, you can throw in a GPS, you know, what it was supposed to take Israel from Egypt to the land of Canaan. You know, it was supposed to be a 10-day trip, 10, 11-day trip. It took them 40 years. <laughs> you put that in a GPS, I think it's 9 to 10 hours. <laughs> and just, just the, it just blows my mind thinking that. Uh but I can just the amount of time and effort Jesus gave willfully every single day, healing people from their sicknesses, um, just giving his time to people, going into people's houses, staying with them for days. Uh, 
and you could say they were poor in spirit. And I mean, he fed five thousand people with what two lo uh, five loaves, two fish, two fish, five loaves. Yeah, you get, yeah. And I mean, absolutely. So, and I know there's many proverbs that tell us to remember the poor. Many proverbs that say remember the poor. Um, all right. Question number four. Before certain men came from James, Peter would eat with Gentile believers. However, when the certain man arrived on the scene, Peter withdrew himself from fellow Gentile brothers and sisters. How did Paul react to this? Why did Peter do this, and what effect did this have on others around him? What can we learn from this? So if you remember Peter's background, he was a Jew. And it seems like in this... In this case, Peter was afraid of what the other Jewish, these false teachers would think of him by you know, his fellowship with Gentiles. When Jesus died, he broke that wall in between Gentiles and Jews, as we all know. He's for everybody. But some Jews, you know, they, they, they say, we're the people of God, we're the chosen people of God, salvation comes through us, which it does, amen, good for you. But Jesus has taken down that division where a Jew can sit with a Samaritan woman now, Jesus can sit with a Samaritan woman, we can sit with our fellow neighbor, it doesn't matter who it is. Uh, but Peter, when these Jewish people came in, well, it seems like he cared more about what they thought about him. That's when he picked up his stuff and he walked away from the Gentiles. Because he did that, we see people like Barnabas, I don't know if you know anything about Barnabas, but he was known as the son of encouragement. That's what that name means. He was a, he encouraged people. That was what he was known for. And uh, he even took him away. He, he fell into that sin with him. So what I take from this is that this brother, Barnabas, Peter, he didn't cause Barnabas to sin, but he influenced him to sin. They both fell in the sin of hypocrisy, and in a sense, that was a moment... Peter divided the Gentiles from the Jews again. And Paul, he was ticked. He, face to face. said, buddy, we got something to talk about. In front of everybody, he calls them out. Um, you, what, do, what do you think about that? Uh, is there anything that comes to your mind that stick out to you? If not, uh, that's okay. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, I think sometimes it's good I won't say they lost their faith. I'd say they lost their, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, their courage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their boldness to. Yeah, they lost, yeah. Their, they lost their, yeah, they lose their faith, but they lost their courage. Mm -hmm. Instead of staying here with the Gentiles right. and worrying about what somebody else is thinking, right. they lost their courage. Yeah. And went back to where it was comfortable. Yeah. Because I imagine it had to take a Jew a lot of courage to sit with a Gentile. Or a Samaritan. I mean, Jews and Samaritans did not like, they just didn't associate. Yeah. And when Jesus decided to sit at the well with a Samaritan woman, <laughs> she was like, how are you, being a Jew, talking to me, a Samaritan woman? <laughs> she was blown away by that fact. Uh, but I think that just goes to show you that, I think that's normal too, some... It's human nature to want to be accepted by people. It is. You don't want to cause friction. You don't want to cause frustration. But Jesus says, though, well, Paul says, those who desire to live Christ, uh, godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean physically persecuted. You can be emotionally persecuted, verbally persecuted. Uh, but if it can happen to Peter, if it can happen to Barnabas, it can happen to us. Mm -hmm. I just think that's something. And the good thing is... Well, not technically good, but just remember that Peter was an ordinary guy. He was a fisherman. He liked to fish. Matthew was a tax collector. This guy, illegally, <laughs> he was a he kind of fraudulent with taxes. Uh, he was just a normal, everyday Joe. And Jesus chose these people. And I just think that's really important to remember. Even though Paul, he was a Jew, uh, he had his issues. He had some. He had a coveting issue. Romans seven, he tells us, he had a big problem with coveting. Uh, but uh, I think that's important to remember. Uh, question number five. Paul, being a Jew, knew that a person cannot in any way, shape, or form be declared righteous before God by keeping the Mosaic law. 
Paul states that it is only, I have this in bold, only by faith in Jesus Christ that a person is made right with God. Nothing more, nothing less. Many people in our culture are still trying to get right with God and stay right with God by their works. But according to Paul, well, this is impossible. Why do you think this isn't the case? We kind of talked about this already. But uh, why, do, why, why do you think it is the case that people... I understand that people come with a certain lens of how they interpret Scripture and they think that's what the Bible teaches. I understand. That's what I thought. I really thought that what I believed was true. To be honest, though, when I became a Christian, I was a baby in Christ. I was hungry for the milk. You know what I mean? The milk of the Word. I was just accepting, accepting, accepting. I, w I didn't really know how to test Scripture. I didn't know how to do any of this. I didn't know how to interpret Scripture. Uh, so I accepted it. Uh, people really believe that, I mean, you, that's why we have Catholics. That's why we have, uh, you know, people who believe you can get right with God by works. That's, they believe what they believe. Uh, but why do, why do you, other than that, why do you think people are still trying to get right with God? Do you have any opinion? Well, it's easier to do it by works. You think so? Oh, yeah. You tell me, you know, hey, Bill, if you'll take uh, $50 a week and Right. Give it to uh, uh, so and so. Yep. Yeah. You know that's going to, that's going to be a ladder to climb. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, it'd be easy. If you yeah. Need right. Here, here's fifty bucks. Right. I'm on the right. I'm on right. The stair step up. You know. And that, I'm, that's easy. Oh know? yeah. And I'm, I think that's what works are. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing it in Christ because you want to, <laughs> to your absolutely yes. Then, then, then it's what it is, like you said. It's it just, you know, you're trying to buy your way in. That's and right. It, and it, there's no buying in. Yeah. And there's a difference between doing works to be justified before God or and doing works because you're thankful for the salvation that God has done, given you. There's two different motives there. So when I quote Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, beautiful passage of Scripture tells you how a person is saved. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's a gift from God, not of works. But then right after that, he says, You are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to, good, to do good works. So those good works are still there, but it's not for your salvation. It's just you should do good works out of gratitude for your salvation you have in Christ. Well, you see things different. Absolutely. And that, and that was hard for me to explain to the, some of the guys I worked with. Was it? Yeah. I see things different. Yeah. I, I may be doing some th that's uh, uh, Charlie is a good example. My, I had a friend at work and him and his wife mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he gave to charity. I mean, you know, he done everything that's a good that every good Christian would do that's right. out of faith and love. That's right. And he was doing it to help. Yeah. You Praise know, God, was, yeah, that's great. And I would tell Charlie you know, and Charlie would give me the standard answer. Well, if there's a God, you'll know what I did, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll be all right. You know, and I'm such a one. No, no, uh, no. That's the problem. You know, no, Charlie, no. That's that boasting. Yeah. You know, but... Mm -hmm. yeah, well, Self-reliance. Self I hear that so much. Well, if there's a God... Absolutely, you know, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know that I worked with one person, um, and they said that, you know, I'm a good person. Well, I know... I know what God says. No one's good. No, but only one's good, and that's God. No one is righteous. Only God is truly righteous. Uh, I'd like to play with my truck, even though it's faded. It says good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven sinners do. That's right. <laughs> I got that. It's faded because it's been on there for a long time. But that's exactly right. That's right. And the guy you're talking about, he... He and means he's a good man. Yeah, he means well, great man, great people in the world that have a lot of money do so much good. Yes. And I praise God. That's wonderful. I, I'm thankful to that person. But when it comes to your spiritual state, God's standard is 100%. If you want to get right with God, by law, well, by doing good things, feeding your neighbor or whatever you want to do, you better do it perfectly 24 7, 7 days a week. And remember, Jesus said that even if you hate your brother, if you're mad, I mean, this goes inwardly. Sermon on the Mount. He said, it's not just about murdering somebody. You want, you hate them. Oh boy, you're, you're guilty. You're done. Uh, it, it, it's more of the inward state. You know, an evil thought. 
gluttony, gossip, all sorts of stuff. All, all these little, we look at little sins, that's a sin. According to the Bible, the wages of sin is death. Done. You're done. There's no going back. That was, I think that's, that just emphasizes the needs, need of Jesus so much. Uh, but, but yeah, I, people still try to get right with God, but Paul's specifically clear. He says, even after, even as a Jew, we know that nobody gets right with God by keeping the law. And even though I've heard this argument, he's talking about the Mosaic law here. The point is, you can't get right with God by doing things. There's a reason. The faith excludes works. Uh, there's one source. It's faith. Y'all know this. I'm say, just repeating myself. <laughs> but I just think he's really trying to make that clear, especially next week, going chapter 3. He makes it crystal clear. He, he dives into it and makes it abundantly clear that justification comes through faith alone. Okay. Um, I got one more question. Question number uh, number 6. What kind of life did the Apostle Paul live after becoming a Christian, and how does a person set aside the grace of God? This is very important. I don't know why I didn't understand this back 2012, 2016, when I was addressed on legalism. Uh, we'll read verse 19 to 21. Paul says, verse 19, to, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Uh, before I jump to verse 21, which I really want to pounce on, uh, the type of life that Paul says he lived was a life... That, in other words, he did not live personally. He said, "It's Christ who lives within me. I died with Christ at the cross. I accepted the gospel. I died with Christ spiritually. I died with Christ. I'm in the flesh, but Christ lives through me." Uh, I've seen this on. Uh, I may have seen this on a bumper sticker or a car or somewhere. But this is a really famous verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. The life, this answers the question, what kind of life did the Apostle Paul live after becoming a Christian? He says, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a big deal. And you know the Apostle Paul's background from the tribe of Benjamin, the Jew of the Jews, the Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he was up there in popularity, I believe. Uh, and for someone to say, like him, to say this, I'm not living by the law no more. I count that as rubbish, he says in his letter to the Philippians. He says, I live by faith now in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a big deal. And I'm no Apostle Paul, but for me to be someone who was entrenched in legalism, and I can confidently say that I live by faith alone, by God's grace through faith alone and Christ alone, it's him who lives through me. Um, for me... That's, oh, I look back at how I did live. Wow, that's a big thing. But two, you know, when I notice my shortcomings, when I notice my flaws, I do not have to be weighed down because Christ has already lifted me up. Same with you. We all have flaws. We're imperfect people. We still got work to do on ourselves. God's working through us. Uh, but there's a difference between the person who is living under law, I know this, and the person who's living under grace person who's living under law, when they're not checking their checking the boxes on the things that they know they need to do, that's going to cause depression, that's going to cause anxiety, that's going to cause lack of sleep, your mind racing during the night. It's not like I'm speaking from personal experience, right? That's exactly where I'm speaking from. And, but the person under grace knows, okay, I know what God wants me to do. I want to do it. I, I, I know I want to do it. Uh, sometimes you get into those habits where you don't feel like you want to do it, though. But... I know God loves me. He saved me by His grace. It's completely about what Jesus did. He looks at me through what Jesus did. He don't look at me for what Gary does because without Jesus, I can't do it. But under grace, in Hebrews, we're told that we can confidently go to the throne of God and accept His grace in our time of need. When you're in need of grace, which I am at times, I go to God's throne confidently knowing that I Get that. Not because of anything I do, but because of what Jesus promised. You know. So I th there's two different people there. There's two different emotional aspects. Cause 
boy, I thought I was going to die of anxiety under law. I really did. It was it was bad. I mean, and I look back now thinking, man, you're so silly, Gary. Why do, why, why, why do you live like <laughs> But, uh, yeah. But, okay, verse 21, last verse. This is big. I wish I would have understood this. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. What does that mean to you? They blew, how, Paul is saying that setting aside the righteousness of God is by trying to get right with Him by law-keeping. To me, that blew my, I was setting aside the grace of God for four years, for a long time, because I didn't want to live under His grace. I wanted to live under law. I said I had the grace of God, but that's not what I was really living under. Uh, he says, if, let me read that again, I do not set aside the grace of God, because if righteousness comes through the law, so in other words, if getting right with God comes through ten commandments, keep those, one commandment, anything, anything, if righteousness comes through keeping those commandments, he says Jesus died for no reason. If you could get right with God by keeping a commandment, Jesus didn't have to come here. Jesus died without any purpose if a person can get right with God by doing works. So I think of the person you mentioned, people I've talked about, well, I'm good, I do good things. Amen, you probably do. But you're not good according to the Scripture, in the the true sense, of the perfection sense. You may do good deeds and you may be good in a sense, but you're not good in the spiritual sense at all. Uh, Neither am I. Uh, uh, But I I just think it's amazing that Paul says, the way to set aside the righteousness of God is by keeping the law to be justified. For me, that, that cuts deep, and I'm glad I understand that now. Uh, but I got a quote from, uh, from verse 21, what I just hammered on, from Tony Evans. I really appreciate his ministry. He says, he encourages us with these words concerning Galatians 2.21. He says, Spirituality, then does not come from performing an external list of rules. This is the heart of legalism. Rather, it comes from the internal flow of grace in and through the life of the believer. In order to live under grace, we must die to the law. There's many times I just want to quote Tony Evans because he says this so much better than I could. <laughs> and I'm like, no, that's plagiarism, but <laughs> you better mention him. <laughs> but he does. He says it a lot better than I ever could. Uh, so, yeah, that's chapter two. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll be able to meet. I hope I, we don't have to wait another month. <laughs> God forbid, please. Uh, we'll come to chapter three, and we'll dive in and just... I I think this is the book of grace. It led me out of legalism. Romans chapter 4 did too. Um, That led me out of legalism. Um, So it was a blessing being able to meet tonight. Uh, So I hope that we don't get blown off the side of the road. Uh, At least it's not like it is in Colorado, right? Yeah. Well, all right. I figure we end in prayer and then we'll just look forward to meeting Sunday. How's that sound? All righty. Father God, thank you for this time we've been able to meet together as your people, as your church. Pray that we can walk away from Galatians chapter 2, knowing that, um, simply put, we're justified by faith in Christ alone. And um, it's so important for us to understand this. And Martin Luther in church history, after breaking away from the Catholic Church, this was something that was amazing to him, that you can be justified, everyone can be justified before your sight, made right with you, simply by believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ, receiving it by faith, apart from anything we do. Um, And this is a promise that you give us. This is how we're made right with you. But never let us forget to obey you out of gratitude for this salvation that we have in Christ, completely apart from our works. Help us to love you and obey you throughout the remainder of this week. Please forgive us for our shortcomings this week. Uh, If we've done anything wrong this week that has been displeasing to you, We know that we have forgiveness in Christ. Please be with our friends and our families during our trials and tribulations we face in life. And we just look forward to meeting with you again and being able to open up your word. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.